five days, Monday through Friday, and lay everything that happens here at the Genesis Center down at your feet, Lord Jesus, that you would do mighty things with it. We pray for the students coming in. We pray for the parents that will be dropping kids off, um, that even if they're just here for 10 minutes in the morning and 10 minutes in the afternoon, that you would make your presence felt, that you would make your name known to them. We pray for the volunteers, both from our church and from all over the Midwest, that you would um, bring those volunteers here and have them just love kids with the love that only flows out of Jesus Christ, your love for them. We pray for um, the Genesis Senate. This is going to be a crazy week, Jesus. And we're blessed that we have this blessing that we can um, share with others and those in our community that um, people would see this as a church, as a people group that want others to know you and that your love and your um, name would be contagious in this community. We pray for safety. We pray for responsibility. We pray for wisdom. We pray against the rain because we want a lot of it to happen outside, Jesus. Thank you for everything that you're going to do. We expect great things because you are a great God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. You guys can take a seat. My name is Johnny Whitcomb. I am the interim youth pastor here at Genesis Church, and I just want to give you guys all a welcome, um, especially if you're watching online or here for the first time ever. Welcome to our church. We're glad that you're with us today. This is the Genesis Center, and on Sundays, we meet at as uh, Genesis Church Petoskey. So um, welcome, and we're super happy that you're here. Um, if you want to connect with us, there are connect cards um, in the seat backs in front of you. We'd be happy um, if you would fill those out. And um, we've got kind of a welcome area in the lobby you can drop those off at, and we have uh, a gift to give you as well out there. So. Um, you can do that if you so choose. We also have an app that you can download. Um, that's super important. Text 77977. Uh, text Genesis app, one word, and you can download our sermon notes. You can um, get more information and calendars through that app. It's a, a really important, a really good thing to have if you call Genesis uh, Church your home church and, and where you go on every Sunday. Or if you just want to get to know us more because you can delete an app. If you're like, ah, this is not for me, just delete it. It's fine. Um, but we hope you don't do that. We really don't. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's uh, it for welcome. Uh, I am also in charge of the one thing this week. I get to run the one thing. So I want to talk about youth group and youth group for the fall, um, stuff that's happening with Genesis Youth. The first thing that we have is a scavenger hunt and bonfire that's actually happening tonight at church, or not at church. It's going to be downtown Petoskey. Um, we're meeting at the Anderson's house, and then we're going to go run around downtown Petoskey for a little bit. It should be fun, a really good time. So we hope that you guys come to that 6 to 8 tonight. Um, and if you're like, whoa, this is the first time that I'm hearing about this. I wish I knew about it sooner. Well, then this next slide is for you because uh, we've got ways to connect, ways to know about um, Genesis Youth. Uh, is that slide up? There it is. Hello. Stay in the loop. Youth group. I wanted that to rhyme more than it does, but that's okay. Uh, the Genesis app, we've got um, a youth page under there that's really important. It's got all of the upcoming dates for middle school and high school and also the addresses for where those things are happening. So if you need directions to the Anderson's house, that will be there in the app for you. Um, you can also text to Genesis at Genesis HS to that number up there, 81010, and that'll give you updates for um, the high school reminders, and then Genesis Mid is updates for the middle school reminders, so really important stuff there. And we've got two open houses, both on the 25th of August. Um, the middle school open house is going to be happening right after church here in the church building. We're just going to explain what's going to come up in the fall program, because if you guys don't know, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but school starts the next week, so that's kind of scary. Not fun, but we do want to have good programs for you all for that, and so make sure that you show up if you're in middle school right after church, and then if you're in high school, it'll be at the Neal's house that same evening, August 25th, and if you text the reminders, you'll get all those reminders and all those updates as well. So that's all the important and youth stuff coming up pretty soon. Uh, at this point, uh, we're going to dismiss kids, so if you're a kid in the building, um, you can go to... Kids Church, um, and if you want to sign them in, there's still opportunity to sign your kids in. If you haven't yet signed them in, uh, there's a station for that at the lobby as well. Uh, other things, 
we're going to have um, Eugene Wong, who's an elder at our church, be preaching today. Um, that's going to be really awesome. But before we do that, turn to your neighbors, say hello to them, shake somebody's hand, welcome somebody. If they're new around here, make sure that they feel welcome, make sure that they feel loved. I'm going to go say hi to Evan Woodall. Good morning, Genesis Church. How are you all? Good? All right. Well, like uh, Johnny said, my name's Eugene. I'm one of the elders here. And I am excited to share God's word with you this morning. So we get, as elders, the, the benefit of, like, milling over this stuff for months. So I feel like I'm about to give birth right now. So, so uh, but I'm really excited. This Psalm 112 is a psalm that has really spoke, has been near and dear to my heart. Um, during this season of my life, and I'm excited to share what God's taught me about uh, through this psalm. So if you would stand and turn with me to page 751 in the Journey Bible, or it will be um, up on the screen as well, we're going to read God's word here. Psalm 112. Praise the Lord. Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who find great delight in his commands. Their children will be mighty in the land, the generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in their houses, and their righteousness endures forever. Even in darkness, light dawns for the upright. And for those who are gracious and compassionate and righteous, good will come to those who are generous and lend freely, who conduct their affairs with justice. Surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. They will have no fear of bad news, their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are secure, and they will have no fear. In the end, they will look in triumph on their foes. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Their horn will be lifted high in honor. The wicked will see and be vexed. They will gnash their teeth and waste away. The longings of the wicked will come to nothing. This is the word of the Lord. You may have a seat. So five years ago, my brother Jeff was getting married in Ogunquit, Maine. And if you've ever been to Ogunquit, it is beautiful. It is gorgeous. Um, it reminds me a lot of where we live, actually. And so it's this gorgeous place, and we were having this wedding, and our family was staying at a bed and breakfast there. And there was a pool, and so, of course, the kids wanted to go to the pool, right? And so we took them to the pool, and like any responsible parent, Alice and I went to the hot tub. So... It was a tiny little hot tub, and um, am I getting some feedback here? A little bit? No. Uh, it was a tiny little hot tub, and uh, there was a, a man about in his mid-50s or so that was in there by himself. And so I struck up a conversation with him, and I asked him, you know, what he did. And he said that, well, I actually retired early. And, um, you know, I retired early because I used to work for the, uh, the oil industry, and I invented this widget, and I made millions on it. And so my wife and I decided to move to the Caribbean. It's like, oh, this is interesting. And so I asked him, well, what do you do in a typical day? I mean, he's got all the money in the world, you know, and he's in the Caribbean. What do you do in a typical day? He said, well, I wake up kind of late, and, you know, in the morning, and we go work out, and we make some smoothies, and, um, you know, I read the paper. Um, then I usually take a nap and make lunch, go snorkeling or walk the beach, and then have you know, dinner with friends. I'm like, boy, this guy's got it good, right? I mean, this is pretty nice what he's got going on. I mean, it seems like the poster child for prosperity and success, right? You, the way they're living their lives. And, but I asked him, I said, 
so, so do you ever miss work? And his answer was really interesting. He said, he said that, you know, when I was working, I was somebody. You know, I had people that um, answered to me, and I was somebody important. I had a purpose. And since I retired, nobody really knows who I am. Oh. Thank you. Sorry. Um, nobody knows who I am. And, um, you know, I, I don't feel like I have much of a purpose. I feel like a nobody. I was like, huh, this is interesting. And about that same time, I had kids, like, they were jumping into, you know, the hot tub and jumping out of the hot tub and splashing everywhere. And I was afraid that they were annoying him a little bit. Um, but he, he kind of looked at me enviously, and he said, don't ever take that for granted. That is worth gold, the relationships that you have with your kids. And so I asked him, I said, do you have kids? And he said that he did, but they no longer spoke to him. You see, when they moved to the Caribbean, th their children had um, grand their grandchildren, and they wanted them to move back, to have a relationship with them. But they chose to stay in the Caribbean. And so their children no longer spoke to, to them um, and they had this broken relationship. So here's a guy that seemingly had everything that the world says is prosperity and success, but was really lonely and feeling purposeless. And that really struck me, like, wow, maybe what the world thinks is successful really isn't all that successful. Because if you think about it, the world basically says the success is what? Uh, having wealth and having things, right? It's it's bigger houses, luxurious cars, fancy vacations, faster boats, you know, um, beautiful cottages, all these types of things, these material things. And this guy had all that, but yet he didn't feel like he was prosperous. He didn't feel like he was successful. So what is true prosperity? That's the question we want to answer today. What is true prosperity? What does the Bible say is true prosperity? So we're going to dig into Psalm 112. Um, but before we do that, I'm going to talk a little back, give a little background here. So Psalm 112 and Psalm 111 are actually linked together. So the Psalms are a book of poems written by different authors. Um, but Psalm 111 is actually a praise psalm that talks about the great works that the Lord has done and his characteristics. And then it links into Psalm 112, which talks about, it's a wisdom psalm. So it talks about the characteristics of those that are faithful to God. And this psalm isn't necessarily a promise, but it's more wise advice. It's like the blueprints to God's prosperity, if you will. So we're just going to dig right in. So recently, I started smoking. At meats, that is. Um, <laughs> people were a little worried for a second, right? So I started smoking, and... Um, and I'm a novice. I really don't know what I'm doing, right? So I'm scouring the Facebook forums and trying to learn every tip I can. And, and it, the interesting thing is everyone has a uh, secret sauce or rub or, or some kind of um, secret ingredient that's going to make their meat a succulent and juicy and flavorful and just, just delicious, right? And so what we're going to talk about right now, I'm, right from the beginning, I'm going to give you the secret sauce to God's prosperity right from the beginning. And so, in fact, we're going to start with the last verse of Psalm 111. Because remember, I told you they were linked, um, which ties right in. So Psalm 111, verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. So the fear of the Lord is this kind of concept that sometimes is hard to understand, right? You're like, am I supposed to be afraid of God? I, mean, I don't get it. And a lot of times we talk about it as reverence for God, putting him in the highest place, putting him in high honored place and high regard. But it's more than just that. It's also recognizing that we are accountable to him. Everything that we do, all the money that we have, the skills, the time that we have is in, that's entrusted to us, we have to properly steward. We're accountable to him. So it's putting him in high regard and also realizing that we're accountable to that. And so there is a, a healthy fear of God in that sense. So this verse says that that fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, beginning of understanding, the beginning of, of making good decisions, and which goes right into Psalm 112, verse 1. Praise the Lord. Blessed 
are those, or prosperous are those, or favored by God are those who fear the Lord. There you go. And also who find great delight in his commands. So this is a two-ingredient special sauce, right? So it's reverence for God, fear of the Lord, and delighting in his commands. Now, I'm so thankful to my brother Rod Anderson, who preached last week, who eloquently told us and taught us about um, delighting in the Lord. And what Rod said last week was, delight starts with trust. And trust comes from faith in God, which means we cannot do this of our own power and will. We are entirely dependent on God to allow us to see him and to delight in him and his commands. So think about this for a second. What do you delight in? Where do you place your delight right now? What do you love? You know, my brother-in-law recently introduced me to this Netflix series, and um, it is hilarious, right? Especially, they're laughing because my daughter's already told them about it, and they watched it. But, but that's, this is what happens, right? When you delight in something, it bring, you know, so this series like, brings me a lot of joy and heart, you know, um, lightheartedness. And, and so, of course... I tell everybody about it, right? And I make time for it, and I might sneak an extra episode in because I want, it just brings me a lot of joy. And so not only do I tell everybody at work and everybody else, my daughters tell everyone. In fact, I heard that the band director watched an episode while during band camp. So, so it, it's spread quite a ways. Um, but that's kind of what God wants us to do with his commands and his word. In fact, uh, Psalm 1, 2 through 3 says, Blessed is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night, day and night. And that person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. So when we delight in something, when we delight in God's commandments, we think about it all the time. We look forward to spending time with God and learning about um, him and who he is and how he wants us to live our lives. So when we do those two things, right, when we are reverent towards God, fear the Lord, and we delight in his commands, you know, this psalmist talks about basically three areas where we can experience God's prosperity. And the first area is legacy. Now, this is a pick of my, uh, my little tribe here. And uh, if, for those that don't know us, we're the crazy family with five kids, right? So, um, <laughs> and so there's my, my amazing wife, Allison, and then our, our five kiddos. And they're great kids, and I love them dearly. And they have so much potential, and I see so much potential in them, and I want the best for them. How many of you would say that you want your kid to be successful? All of us, right? We, we all want to see our kids do well in life. And this psalmist talks in verse 2 exactly about this very thing. So when we do the, when we look at the secret sauce and we live that out in Psalm 112, verse 2 says their children will be mighty. They will be influential. They'll be successful in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. So not only will we be blessed, but we will be a blessing to our children and to a whole generation. Here's the thing, though. This is an interesting observation that I'm, I've made. And it may not be very popular, and I'm okay with that, because if you don't like it, I'm not going to be back next week, so you don't have to worry, okay? But, um, but um, here's the observation. I think in our community, in Petoskey, there is an unspoken formula for a successful child. And it goes something like this. At a very young age in grade school, you expose them to lots of different types of activities, right? And whether it's music instruments or sports or whatever, you expose them to lots of things. And as they get older, into middle school and whatever, you know, you get more intensified in those things. So you, you're in travel teams and you have an orchestra or other, other things. And then you get into high school and then now they're in band and they're in sports, they're in uh, NHS and they're, you know, dual enrolled and they're taking AP classes and they go on and on and on and on. And they're running around with like, like a chicken with their head cut off, right? These are all good things. And they're, but they're all external thing, influences in your child's life. And that's what we hope that when we do all those things, that somehow they will land a good college and, and a good job later on, and they'll be successful in life. 
And you've all just said that you want to see your kid turn out right, right? You say you want to see your kid turn out right, but what this verse is telling you is that your kid is going to turn out like you. Are you okay with that? What this verse is saying is that, that when you model, when you model being reverent before God, putting him in the highest place in your life, and that you are delighting in spending time with him and delighting in understanding his commandments and who God is, that when you model that for your children, they will see that and they will grab onto that, and they too will do the same thing and be mighty in the land. They will be successful. We're the main influence in their life. But yet, at the same token, we're depending on these external influences to, to kind of pave a path for them. Now, I'm not saying that these activities are bad and you should quit all those things. So if there are any coaches or band directors out there, I'm, that's not what I'm saying. They're all, these are all good things. But what I'm saying is that that does not replace our responsibility to model these things for our children. And that is crucial um, for their well-being and for their success. And, you know, the truth is, I'm, this is, I'm not trying to be judgy about this because I'm in it with you. Our kids are involved in a lot of these activities, and we ha find that same struggle of how finding that balance. So I'm in it with you. But what I'm saying, if you would join us in that struggle, you know, take to heart what the Scripture says and really think about and ask God to reveal to you where you stand in those two areas. Um, I think that you will find that there will be so much fruit that will come from that in your children. So we talked about legacy. And the second area that I believe the psalmist talks about is provisions. And th these blue bags that you see here are put together by um, a small church in Athens, Greece. And Ali and I were there in February and uh, when we were um, ministering to the Syrian refugees. And so in this bag is about a month's worth of sustenance for um, a family of four, basically. And so this church is probably a quarter of the size of what we are. Uh, but they have ministered to thousands and thousands of refugees. And so I was asking the pastor, I was like, how do you fund this thing? And, he, and you know what he said was, he's like, you know, well, we depend on God for his provisions. We get it through tithes and gifts, and when we have money, then we buy, you know, bulk, a lot of the grains and things, and then we put together these bags and distribute them, and, and when we run out, we run out, and we pray for God, I pray to God for more provisions, and, and then he gives, you know, more comes in, and we do the same thing again, and I thought it was so cool for two, two reasons. I, it was such a great way of how we should, a uh, great example of how we should live out um, our own personal lives, right? I mean, they still paid for the lights to keep the lights up in the church and all that kind of stuff, but in their, in their abundance, they gave generously. Um, but the other thing was not only did they give generously, but they were being a blessing to others with that. They were being God's provision to many others that were needier than they were, um, with, um, than, than they were there. So, so what they understood were these uh, verse 3 and 5 and 9, in this psalm. So verse 3 says, Wealth and riches are in their houses, and their righteousness endures forever. Now, if you take this out of context, you're like, whoa, here's a, here it is, right? This is the formula to get rich, right? So we, I do these two things, and God's going to give me a ton of cash, and boom, we're set, right? But this is where it's important to understand context. So the cultural context is that in a culture like ancient Israel that was based on uh, subsistence agriculture, you know, wealth meant basically good crops, a well-fed family, and a stable farm to give to your kids. So it was enough. It was just enough um, to, to provide for yourself. It wasn't necessarily the luxurious wealth that we think of um, in this modern day. And it wasn't just that there was enough for yourself. Notice the second part of that verse, that their righteousness or their just deeds endures forever. So God has a purpose for our wealth, right? God has a purpose for um, what he entrusts to us. So what are these just deeds? Well, verse 5 talks about it. It says, good will come to those who are generous and lend freely, who conduct their affairs with justice. So God's purpose for our abundance, uh, our abundant wealth is generosity. 
God's purpose is for generosity. And in addition to that, you know, he talks about conducting our affairs with justice. So sometimes the best witness that we can be for God does not involve words. The best witness is through actions, through dealing fairly in our business um, or in our interactions with others, right? And this is reinforced, reinforced, I'm sorry, reinforced further in verse 9 when they said that they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor and their righteousness endures forever. Their horn, which is their might and their influence, will be lifted high in honor. So what barriers keep you from being generous? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, I know we have a very generous church. I've seen you guys give um, even beyond your means sometimes. But even in my own life, you know, there are barriers sometimes that keep me from giving, right? Whether it's, you know, I, oh, I got a big bill this week or whatever it is, that think about what are barriers keep you from being generous? Because here's the thing. Remember, going back to the secret sauce, right? When, when we delight in the Lord, we're content, we're, we're content, and our mind isn't preoccupied with coveting the next bright, shiny thing, right? You stop saying things like, boy, my life would be perfect if I had this, or boy, if I had this experience, man, things would be just amazing in my life. And slowly, God's desires become our desires when we delight in the Lord. And Matthew six twenty four spells this out really well. It says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So what is it for you? Is it God or money? You know, like I said, this is, a, this is an area of personal struggle for myself. And I have to remind myself daily that God has entrusted wealth to me for a purpose. And Jesus tells this story that really... Um, Tell, it really shows what that purpose is. So he talks about this farmer that had a bumper crop one year, had this huge harvest, right? And so he was like, man, what do I do with all this? And so he said, oh, I know. I'm going to tear down my barns, build bigger ones, store all of this. Then I'm going to take it easy, and I'm just going to chill. I'm going to live off of this wealth, uh, and not have to worry about anything. Do you know what Jesus calls this person? This is verse 20 in, in Luke here. You fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be for, with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Ouch. That's pretty harsh, right? You fool. I mean, it just shows the futility of the belief that wealth can secure prosperity or a good life. And that gentleman that I met in the hot tub, was a great example of that. Notice that the issue that Jesus talks about isn't that the individual had wealth. That was not the issue. But rather the issue is the farmer's heart and his view of the purpose of that wealth. See, when we are generous and freely give, as Psalm 112 talks about, we are being rich toward God, and we are being used by God to be his provision for others in need. So we talked about legacy and provision, and the last area that I believe the psalmist speaks of in terms of God's prosperity is peace in the midst of trials. Now, this gregarious Ghanaian gentleman here is Enoch. This is my friend Enoch. Enoch is a godly man, a wise man. I, I think of him as the Ghanaian Yoda. So I mean, you just kind of want to sit and listen to his, to his wisdom. But uh, Enoch is the head of Ghana Christian Mission, which is an organization our church has partnered with and uh, ha has built a, a uh, kind of a regional hospital and a nurse's quarters, which is done, by the way. If you want pictures, I can show you. Um, but anyway, Enoch is this wise man. And so on our trip in Ghana, um, we uh, had a young gal by the name of Ashley, and she was probably in, uh, at the end of her high school career, so she was a senior. And so she had an iPhone and left it on, so she's a little naive, but she left it on a tabletop in the classroom in Ghana. Well, long and behold, it was stolen. And so she was pretty upset, and she was pretty anxious. I think she was more anxious about what her parents were going to say. But she was anxious nonetheless. And, but, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it wasn't like she got malaria or, you know, Ebola or anything else. You know, it's just it, it, she lost her phone, right? Well, Enoch, we, you know, we circled up at the end of the day, like we do every day, and we were 
praising God for what he had done. And Enoch gets in the center of the circle, and he, sa- he says, Brothers and sisters, someone has violated the house of God and stole our sister's cell phone. And we are going to pray the cell phone back to the clinic. I believe in prayer, right? <laughs> and I believe that God hears our prayers. But even that one seemed a little far, you know, fetched here. I mean, like, someone was long gone, was going to come back and return the cell phone. So he starts praying, and he prays with the utmost confidence as he's praying. And he prays that, God, would you convict the heart of the person that took Ashley's phone and that have him or her bring it back and return it to Ashley? And I was like, okay, all right. And wouldn't you know, the next morning, this person came back to the clinic and apologized and returned that phone. It's such a small thing, but it made a huge impact in my mind because what Enoch understood is what these verses talk about in 4 and all the way through uh, 10 here. So verse 4 says, even in darkness, even when you're in the midst of your trial, even when you are going through hardship, light dawns for the upright, for those who are gracious and compassionate and righteous. And light is another word for God's direction, his guidance, his wisdom. Light dawns for the upright. In verse 6, surely the righteous will never be shaken. Surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will be stable. They will be remembered forever. They will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. In the end, they will look at their, in triumph on their foes. Verse 10, the wicked will see and be vexed. They will gnash their teeth and waste away. They'll be speechless. The longings of the wicked will come to nothing, just like the guy that stole his cell phone. Do you ever get anxious? Do you ever struggle with fear? I mean, we all do at some point of our lives, right? But think about the script in your head the last time you were anxious. Maybe it's something like, uh, but I can't do this because, or what if this happens to me, or what will others think? Um, there's a lot weighing on your shoulders, isn't there? Fear immobilizes us and keeps us from experiencing and living in peace. You cannot prosper with fear in your lives. You cannot prosper with fear in your lives. But the righteous are secure and they have great expectations for their lives. Not because that they think they are great in themselves, but because they have full confidence in God, just as Enoch had confidence in God. That's why they are confident. So I'm going to ask the band to come up as we close here. And you may be saying, like, man, this all sounds good. You know, I, I, I like the idea of, of having a legacy with my kids and having provisions, certainly provisions, and, and peace during times of difficulty and trial. But where do I start? You see, you can't experience God's prosperity without pursuing a relationship with God. And that relationship starts with a, uh, a relationship with Jesus Christ. It starts with making Jesus the leader in your life. And so if you haven't done that this morning, or I think this morning, if you haven't done that in, the, in your life, this is a great time to do it. And I would invite you to do that. In fact, there is a prayer of faith in your program that you can read and pray that to God. And if you do that this morning, um, tell somebody about it. Come tell me or one of the prayer team people or Pastor Norm. Um, you know, and we would love to walk with you through those initial steps, but it starts with a relationship with Jesus Christ. And once we develop that relationship and we learn and more about who God is and what he has done for us, and you become all inspired of who God is, you begin to trust him more. And as you trust him more, you begin to delight in him. And when you start to delight in him, you start to experience the blessings, the many blessings that he bestows upon us when we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Amen?
morning. So we're going to reflect on that word. It's a good word this morning. And we're going to believe God to, or I, I pray that you would join me in believing God to set us free. Um, I think in this message, we all have probably some struggle in one of these areas. And God is so good that he can help us to overcome. 